Does everyone have the API key working? Can you run knife CS template list and so forth? One? Yes? Yes. Which file are you looking at? It's a dot shell, so it's hidden. Okay, and move that out, but it's not no, the file that you Okay. Yeah, because you got to add these lines. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just these three lines you need. This command's still running. Slow, slow, slow. Let me know when you're good. Okay. Anyone else? Everyone ready to keep going? Okay. <laughs> so this, you won't really miss anything. So, um, so we want to do knife server knife cs server create but we need to discover what we can actually do um so you want to add in oh there's a lot of text so there's this nice utility so there's a bunch of different commands and switches and all these various things that you want to add in when you actually run this command. Uh, so some things that are common that you might use. So no bootstrap, so you don't want it to actually bootstrap it with Chef. Maybe you want to bootstrap it later. Um, if there is a node name you want to specify, then you can specify that node name. You can actually feed in the API key if you need to. Um, CloudStack password, so it enables auto-generated passwords by CloudStack, which might be useful. Um, the things that we're going to have to pass are service and then template as well. And then uh, if you had a particular zone you wanted to provision into, you could specify that as well. Uh, firewall rules, if we wanted to add in firewall rules as part of the launch, we could. And then also, if you are bootstrapping it with Chef, you could actually apply a run list. That's funny how like the screen doesn't show that I've actually highlighted that line. So the run list here, you can actually specify Chef recipes or Chef roles that you want to be applied as part of it. Other useful bits, so the username and the SSH password as well, if you have to specify that information as well, which is used by the bootstrap. So we want to run knife cs server create. Um, we're going to give it a name, so we'll just call it web01. Uh, specify a template. Actually, let me do this first, template list. And then run service list. And now we can run the server create. Uh, so we want to specify the template name. So in this case, I'll choose this. Choose, um, preferably choose a CentOS uh, OS on Exascale. 
so that you're doing the same things that I'm doing. Um, or we could do Ubuntu. Preference, Ubuntu or CentOS? Hmm? Well, Debian's essentially, or Ubuntu is essentially Debian, right? You want to do Ubuntu? Okay. So we will choose Ubuntu, please. And then we need to specify the service. So for me, it's T1 Micro is what I'm going to use. For you, it would be whatever you want to choose from Exascale if you're using Exascale. Um, sorry, I got to scroll. Um, Cloud Stack Password. SSH user, which in my case, it's root, which you always want to SSH to your machines as root, especially over the internet. Um, and I need to specify no public IP. Not 100% sure if you guys need to in Exascale. Um, what this basically does is if, um, so the way CloudN is set up is my machine's actually directly on, I get a, like a publicly addressable internet address because it's a telecommunications provider and like telcos, right, have like IP addresses going out of their butt. And I'm glad this is on video. Uh, whereas like everybody else has to use private addresses then map it back. So this actually prevents it from mapping it back because if I map it back, it'll actually, you'll try to map it back by default, um, try to give you a public IP and map it back to the private IP. And in CloudN, we don't have that functionality. I forget what there is in Exascale. Um, and the last thing I'm gonna specify is no bootstrap. And there's a reason why I'm gonna do that. But you guys do that as well because we'll bootstrap it as part of a separate process. Uh, good question. Um, let me see if I can find it. So this is totally like kind of off topic. So. Sorry. <laughs> so this is a great book that um, Sebastian from uh, Apache Cloud Stack put out. And he has it available on GitHub, so his username is Ron Seb. Um, and he also has printed copies of it as well. But it essentially kind of runs you through using Nice Cloud Stack. Um, so you can specify fields here. So what I believe you need to do when you do Nice CS template list, you need to specify fields name uh, and ID. And then this will give you the GUID. And then we have to use that. And then you use the GUID, okay. right? And so let me see how we use the GUID. So of course he uses the So try using the template GUID instead of just the template name and see if that works for you. Yeah. 
So the nice thing is, is like all of these commands that we're running are available in this book as well, so that you can, uh, if you don't have it down pat, you can actually go and uh, um, do it later. <coughs> do you still need that URL? No, I got the URL. You got it? What do you mean select field? Or how do you print the field? It's, uh, And this is another feature that's kind of um, specific to the Knight Cloud Stack plugin that they, the maintainers added in, which I think is a great addition. So did using the GUID work? Well, um, this is the services, but not the templates. Templates for where I was seeing multiple because the services. Yeah, but this this should still work. No, no, I understand. So, night template CS template. See, you still get the GUID. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So this this field is actually not specific to the noun. So. The way the the way the uh, plugins work is that they have uh, they have the plugin you're using, the noun, and then the verb, right? So it's all of a common thing, yeah. and the field is actually not specific to the noun. It can be used all over the place. So I can actually do night server list. Sorry, night cs server list, and do fields and do ID name. And it's going to give me back the GUI. Yeah. So using the GUID for the template work. Or no, it doesn't work. Oh, because I've already got sorry. So you should be able to run the server create and you'll get this information, you'll get this coming back. And it should just return to the command line. So, so we didn't bootstrap it, we didn't do anything special with it, right? Does everyone create a, did everyone create a server or in the process of creating a server? And if not, speak up so I can come help you. I got that exact same thing. Um, try a different name and maybe put your name in front of web because gotcha. I think there's like a collision in the namespace. Shouldn't everybody have their own namespace though? You would think. 
<laughs> but I don't think it's actually working that way inside of at least this cloud provider. Um, have you given up? You look tired, man. You look jet lagged. This could take a while. <laughs> oh, okay. But it takes a while. I'm totally walking out of frame. Sorry. <laughs> Do you work? I'm not even trying to. I'm just trying to get the high level. Okay, good. How about you? You're what? I, I lost the flow. You yeah. lost what? I lost the flow. So what we are doing, and you know, because I just laid out. Oh, so okay. 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 Right. Yes. No problem. Here, like, uh, I think about that. It took a while to this out. Mm-hmm. Just build again. Write the XML. So that's the Japanese endpoint you're using. Oh, okay. So just open a web browser for me. So this URL. So client on down. No, 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 this way. Mm-hmm. And then the API, put API on the end. <coughs> Where are you editing this file? Can you cat it to make sure it's in there? Can you cat the file or show me the file? I just like one of the requests. And that's all one line, right? And then can you do night? Can you were you able to run the night commands against the server itself? So like night client list. Uh, and then try, we saved this, right? Yeah, Unix format. So let me verify one thing. It's not API endpoint, it's cloud stack URL. Yeah, so look on the screen. Cloud stack underscore URL. You have cloud stack API endpoint. That won't work. <clears throat> so everyone have a machine up? Or everyone who's continuing to follow along have a machine up? So uh, now we can do knife. And um, I'll try and go slow because I know we got one person trying to catch up. So we can do knife bootstrap. And we can specify an IP address. And you're going to want to be in your chef repo directory. Just so all of this needs to take place, place in your chef repo. Um, and before we run this command, let's actually look at the switches we can pass to it so we know what we're actually doing here. So if I do knife bootstrap help, then it's going to give me a bunch of help. The things that we are concerned about is we need to know uh, what the SSH user is, and we need to know what the SSH password is. We just got the SSH password, and let me actually copy it before it goes out of my scroll buffer. Um, so it looks like knife bootstrap FQDN, hostname or IP address, and then the options. 
So some things, if we had a proxy we needed to go behind, we could pass in the proxy URL. If there's a version of Chef Client that we want to install, we can install that version. We can specify the node name and a bunch of other kind of information as well. The things that we want are down here at the bottom. Um, mainly the uh, SSH user, the SSH port. Uh, there is an option for the identity file if you're using keys as you should be. Uh, if you need to run sudo because your SSH user isn't root as you shouldn't be doing, then uh, use sudo to actually do that and then also the sudo password if you had to put in a sudo password. Um, the other thing is if you need to pass in a template file. So by default we kind of have a default out of the box template file that we use. If there is a different template file for whatever reason because you need to install Chef Client differently or you need to download the Chef Client from an internal server versus installing it over the internet, then you can actually specify that template file to do that. So it looks like we're going to need user and password, and that's really all we need. Are you guys, do you guys know if you log in as root or another user to your machine? Ubuntu doesn't, doesn't, do, doesn't have a root account by default. OK, so it's Ubuntu. Yeah. yeah. So in your case, you'll have to pass in the sudo password, or the sudo switch. Um, so we'll pass in the IP address, which is And we're not going to specify a run list right now because we don't have anything in Chef to actually manage or to do. <clears throat> yes? Do you know which ports are you connect? Uh, it's port 22. So okay, so, so, so. I'm setting you up to fail intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> can, so, you show, can you show your create call? Update? Yeah. Hold on a second, let me clear the screen. There you go. So in this case, um, so in Exoscale, they have a whole bunch of different templates with different sized disks. And in that case, you want to use the GUID of the template. Did you see that part? Uh, I'm on Vario, so that's OK. Right then that's not an issue. So if you have this bootstrap command done, do you still need to see that? OK. So go ahead and if you think you have the bootstrap command correctly formatted, go ahead and hit enter and let's see if it works. It's probably not. Anyone know why it's not going to work? Your port is not open. So you need to go into Exoscale. You need to go into your security group. You need to open up the ports. You need to open ingress and egress, right? So open up ingress on port 22 from this IP address, or if you want to open it up to the world, it's up to you. Um, and then open up egress to anything, just because it makes it e easier. Excuse me? Egress is not uh, needed for uh, extra security. OK. All right. There's a tag that was an option for it. Oh, OK. Let me know when you're done with this command. So for the Vario guys, if you, you don't have to type in that GUID, you can actually type in this name. You're using uh, Vario, right? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so the exascale guys needed to use the GUID. In Vario, we don't need to use the GUID. We can use the name. You good? So did anyone's bootstrap work after you opened the port? Mine didn't work. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. No, it should run, and you should see a lot of blue output. See what Sebastian has to say. I feel like admin or something. So in this case, in CentOS, it's a root. I don't know what it is. What? Usually, when you install Ubuntu manually, it asks you to provide a non-root account. Yeah. So they might default to something. It says root. It's possible to enable the root account under Ubuntu. Oh, this just doesn't happen by default, so maybe they did. If you're trying to get root, you can try taking the uh, yeah. secure out also. I got to fix this. So it looks like root works on Ubuntu. Well, I'm, this is very though. I don't know what it is on Exascale. So this is what you should be seeing if it worked. So who's not working? So root on Exascale works. Yeah, I found root on that console. It says user right there. Oh, okay. First time you open it. OK. What's after the dash with capital P? Uh, the password for root that you should have got from your uh, uh, launch command. It should have been part of the output. So right there, password. Since we're not using key files in this case. And then I don't need the... You don't need the sudo, though. Did you open up port 22? Yeah, so go to, uh, go to the UI, it's just easier. And we can do cloud and portal. Yeah, and go right to network. Uh, click on the call. Yeah. Ingress rule. 22. Yeah. 
and then you got to add a decider. Zero dot zero dot zero dot zero stop. Zero. I don't know if you need the egress rule. You can try it without it. Yeah. But it fails quickly. Okay. No, you don't need the egress. Uh, what you would need is so it could actually go out to the internet. But I don't know if it's open by default. So go back to your bootstrap. Try your bootstrap. Yeah, I just did. Oh, it is. Okay, sorry. Can you SSH to that box directly? So now if you go over into the, um, um, so try adding an egress rule for you to starting at zero to 65535. So like enable all ports and then to zero dot zero dot zero dot zero slash. So it, you'll notice here that we've actually, um, we're converging nothing, so we have nothing to actually install on the server, right, in this case. Um, you'll also notice is that we, you'll see this line, creating a new client key identity for this long name. Um, and it says, using the validator key. So in your .chef directory, there's a, two, a couple pen files. One is your username.pim, and one is your org name validatorpim and in order to bootstrap a machine, you need access to the validator key. And what that essentially does is you put it onto the client and it tells the client, this is who I am. I, I'm part of this organization and I'm allowed to register with the shop server. And then after that, it'll generate a new client key for itself. And then every other transaction after that with the chef server will be using the client key. Did your uh, bootstrap work? No, but it returns a, like a zero exit code on that command. So I'm still getting this So let's see your laptop. Oh, no, no, sorry. I don't like to do this. But. So for those of you, um, so down to a knife client list, and you should see the client that you just bootstrapped there in the list of clients.
that's really weird. What was, what was the last two steps in there? Um, so I changed the user to cloud end, and it worked. Whereas like I was able to do it as root. <laughs> but your image won't let you do it as root. Let me see your create. So we have a node. So let's play around with a little bit of knife. Clear. So we have knife uh, node list. And it'll come back with our node eventually. Wait for it. That's why I would not be getting out to the internet. I hate that they record these things because like there's nothing that ever goes right, right? <laughs> and so now like all this failure is just on tape. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I did not pay him to say that. Um, so you could, I could, possibly. Uh, how about I give you my credit card and you can go down and bring beers back to the room. Um, so now you should see your server, right? Everyone see the server? Um, you could do knife node show and specify the server name. And it should give you some info about the server. So now we got more info. This is kind of all, that's why I did it. I launched a CentOS box. I didn't launch a Ubuntu box. Um, I swear I put Ubuntu in that command line. <laughs> I'll, launch a, I'll launch another one here in a second. So the other part is I can do a dash L. And actually, I want a little lowercase l. And I can get long format. So now you can see a whole crap ton of information that you can get back about your server. So this is all like the information that we get out of the box. Um, so tons and tons of info, BIOS info, hardware info, CPU, memory, all that good stuff. Uh, that's a lot of data. I may not want all that data. Uh, or I might want it in a more programmatic format. What I can actually do is specify the dash F flag, capital F and then J, and I can get the format back in JSON or JSON. Um, and so now it's more programmatic. I can parse it. I can consume it better if I'm actually consuming it somehow. Um, then the other bit. Why does it have Java installed? Hmm. Um, we can also now search, right? Even though we just have one node, I can say, um, show me all the nodes where platform is, uh, I think rel might work. You'll want to do, I think, Ubuntu in this case. There you go. So I'm going to say search, show me all the nodes where platform is CentOS. You could wildcard this if you wanted to. So I could say um, this. If this is too much info and I just want uh, one piece of information from this search, I can just ask for just give me this one attribute, so this just this one piece of information, and then I get this one piece of information back, right? Everyone have a node up working? All right. So I'm on the same page of you. Let me launch another server real quick.
So I'm going to bootstrap myself an Ubuntu machine because we're all on Ubuntu and the commands that I'm going to be running, and we want to make sure that they're all consistent. Because of course, CentOS and Ubuntu, right, they have to do things differently. Uh, and if you guys want to, if you promise to come back, we can take a short break. So it's really interesting is we released 11.12 yesterday, but we're not shipping it via this installation routine yet. <laughs> All right, so good, it's up. Um, so this is an this is important thing to talk about. So I just did a search and I said, show me everything about a platform and my search results don't come back yet. Uh, search results take a while to index, so they don't automatically or instantly available, so you might have to wait like 60 seconds for your search results to actually be available. If you're running Chef locally in your own network, you can actually tune that and have the index in take place quicker. Uh, the problem is that puts load on the server, and thus if you have a large environment, that may not be something that you want to change. So now you can see I've got an Ubuntu box, I've got a CentOS box. Great, that's awesome. So now we want to do, um, let's start writing our own cookbook. So I've actually got slides for this. No, no, let me get to where we want to be. All right, so this will actually go a lot smoother because we have like slides and it, it commands you guys type and it actually goes really fast. So let's write an Apache cookbook. Um, so we want to learn what a cookbook is, explain the recipe and the concepts of recipes. Um, we're going to use the package service and cookbook file resources and then we're going to upload a cookbook to the server itself. So um, a cookbook is essentially a collection of recipes, just like, like you would expect in cooking. It's the exact same definition. Um, recipes are essentially different definitions of how the infrastructure should look or how your server should look. And then there's supplementary files like files, templates, libraries, uh, attributes, and some other things that get shipped with a cookbook to make the, the food taste good. Uh, and so typically, cookbooks map one-to-one -to, -one to a piece of software. So you have a HA proxy cookbook, you have an Apache cookbook, and so forth, right? Uh, sometimes, you, if it's a custom application, you might be installing multiple things. But ideally, what you want to have is like small bits of automation that then you can take and piece together to build the larger automation that you need. So there's like components of automation. Um, so we want to install a web server. So here's all the steps that we need to do. Um, pretty easy. So we need to install Apache, we need to start the service and make sure it's always there, and then write a home page for ourselves. So here you go. So that will actually create the skeleton. Uh, it's gonna, you wanna be in your repo when you do this, and this will actually create the skeleton for you uh, inside of the cookbooks directory that will actually give you everything you need to start writing this cookbook. 
So now if you run ls-la cookbooks Apache, you should see output like this. Does everyone have output like this? Yep. All right. Um, so if you have Sublime open, so what's awesome about Sublime is if you, um, at least on the Mac, it should work on a Windows or a Linux box at least as well. If you run the Sublime command and then put in dot, it'll actually open a window and it'll put you into that directory. And so you get a nice little drawer over here to where you can then be go, go and open up things that are in your repository. So knife cookbook create Apache. It created it for me. And now over in my drawer here, I can see that I've got Apache. And I can see all of the files and stuff like that that I need to edit inside of there. So back to our slides. So what we want to do is we want to open, in your editor of choice, cookbooks, Apache, recipes, default. RB. So there's a lot of what's called default files in Chef. And what these do is if you don't specify a recipe and you just say, I want this cookbook applied, by default what's going to happen is the default will get applied. But what you can do is you can always, inside of a, res inside of a run list, you can say, I want this particular recipe from this cookbook, right? So in some cases, you might have, um, um, like say in the case of Apache, right? You might have the default that actually installs Apache, but then you might have one for mod PHP. You might have one for mod Perl, right? Or uh, any other modules that you might want to install. Because every time you install Apache, you may not want those modules. But then there are instances where you want those modules, right? So you can specify little bits of automation that you can actually install. So you should have this, and the first thing we're gonna do, and this is actually wrong, this is, uh, this is for CentOS, but in this case, package Apache 2, do, action install. You guys said you wanted to use Ubuntu's, this is written for CentOS, suck it up. So this needs to be Apache 2, just so we're clear here. This is essentially just the RPM name. So what's going to happen here is this is uh, going to figure out what operating system I'm running on, and then it'll use that operating system's package repository system to go and attempt to install the RPM name that you put in there, right? So whatever you get from app cache search, right? So the RPM name or yum search, right? That's what we'll need to go into there. So uh, this is so this is what we call in Chef a resource. Um, essentially, this is the resource, and this is what we're going to do to that resource. So the resource is named. It's a package which is named this. We're going to install it. The other things that we could do is we could remove it as well, right? Um, Additionally, you can um, pass in parameters as well. So in the case of a file, you might have the owner, right, and the group and things like that. So what I just said. So we're declaring what's going to happen. We're going to say we want it installed, but we're going to let Chef figure out how it should actually be installed, right? And the action is determined through what we call providers. So think of resources as kind of the .h files in C, whereas providers are the .c files that actually have the implementation inside of them, the magic that figures out how things should work. Uh, so if we, were in, if we were to install you know, the subversion package, right, uh, then we would run the right command based upon what platform we're running on. And it works on, you know, uh, Solaris. Is that Solaris, right? Yeah. 
So the other command you need to actually add in as well is, um, so we've, we're installing the package, now we want to install the, uh, the service. Or we're not installing the service, we're defining the state of the service, right? Yeah, that's actually a typo. It should be over. No, it doesn't matter. It's mainly for formatting purposes. And in Ubuntu, what's the service name? Is it Apache 2? Yeah, so you want to make sure it's Apache 2, not HTTPD. Uh, so this is, I kind of already talked about this earlier. We're going to have this service. We're defining the state. The state is it needs to be enabled and it needs to be started. And the other thing is that these are actually executed in order, right? So the first thing that's going to happen is the package gets installed. The second thing that will happen is the service gets enabled. If you try to enable the service before the package is installed, what will happen? It will fail, right? So we're not. Well, the thing that's different about Chef in some ways is that we don't actually give you the opportunity to build this big dependency tree. Uh, we make you write it the way you want it executed, right? So this, this depends on this. The way the dependency is taken care of is you just make sure that that's written before this, right? Um, so this means that if, so, in, so what's happening here is this template, every time this template is changed, it's going to notify the service HA proxy, service HA proxy, to restart. And so what this is saying is that I support restarting. And thus, people can basically do notifications to me, and I'll sit there and I'll be notified to restart this when this configuration file changes, right? So when you write out a new configuration for a, a daemon or something like that, you might need to reload it or restart it. Gotcha. Yep. How is that template file being associated? Is that just automatic because it understands the package? This template file? Yeah. So this is, you have to define it and you have to provide it. How is the restart linked to the service? What do you mean? So how does that service know how to restart when that configuration file changes? Because this actually, so it's kind of like behind the scenes magic that takes place. Uh, essentially, it puts on a stack that there's a restart that needs to take place of the service. And it, it, you can say it needs to be immediate or it can be delayed. By default, it's delayed. And so essentially, this essentially just puts on the stack of all the services that need to get touched or all the notifications that this will happen at the end of the chef run. Okay. Yeah. So it won't necessarily happen immediately. But no, not unless you tell it to not unless you tell it to do it okay. immediately. Because there could be something that changes down the line that needs to now expect that service to be in that newly configured state. Okay. Right? Because maybe you hit an API or something, right? Which template? So we haven't talked about template blocks yet, but we can. So this, in this case, this is saying I have a template resource. This is where it's going to be saved at on the node, right? This is where I get the default template from. And uh, you notice it's a, a .erb file. It's essentially a embedded, well, it's, I keep running into this. I'm going to knock it over eventually. Uh, so it's an embedded Ruby file. It's very similar to kind of like a PHP file to where it's parsed and then uh, parameters are replaced inside of that file. And then also you can actually embed Ruby. So if you have a loop or something like that, you can actually have that loop in there. And so what will happen is if you have parameters or attributes inside of this file, they'll get replaced at runtime when that file is written up. Um, and so we'll create a template. So um, we'll add this template in. I 
that's actually wrong. It says add a cookbook file resource. This isn't a cookbook file, we're adding a template. But add this in anyway. Did I lose you? And so I already talked about the resources. Um, and so this should be your recipe, right? So we have three resources, a package, a service, and a template, right? And now we need to create a new file. We need to create a template. So in cookbooks, Apache, templates, default, create a file index.html.erb, and just throw that in there for now. This one? Yeah. Okay. Everyone have the template created? Or, all right, so once you've saved all of those files, you should be able to do this and upload it to the server. Good. And you should get that success message. So now we need to edit the run list of the node. There's a couple different ways that we can do that. We can go to the web UI and we can actually do it there at manage.opscode.com, edit the run list there. We can also do it via the command line as well. But the run list is essentially uh, determines the order of what recipes and roles will be ran. And so that's essentially how you specify recipes, and that's how you specify roles, which we'll talk about. And so we actually want to run this command. So the node one actually be, needs to be the full name of your node. So it's probably like, in my case, it's a really long name. If you do knife node list, whatever's shown there is what needs to be up there. Action colon install or action space colon install. The colon goes in front of the I. So um, everyone get the run list edited? Fine. So now you need to run Chef Client on the node, and I'm going to break out of the slides here for a second. There's a couple different ways that we can do that. Um, you can SSH to the machine directly, uh, or you can run knife SSH, and it's going to holler at me. Um, And what Knife SSH will do is it'll run a search. So you notice Knife SSH the query, then the command that you want to run. And then you need to pass in whatever information. So in this case, we would want to do Knife SSH. Um, my query. So in your guys' case, you could do node star because you only have one node. And 
x, whatever user you need to log in as. I have to log in as cloud n. And then and I have to use sudo as well. And you want your command right after that. So what I want to do is shut. I don't think that's right. <coughs> yeah, this won't work for me because um, it'll work for you guys because you're running it as root. Um, but I can't run this via sudo. So let's just see what will happen. <coughs> Sorry, you want to specify name, not node. Uh, and I kind of connect to it. The other option is just SSH as cloud n to your server. And then run sudo shut client. And it should so I didn't specify, I didn't change my run list. So bad me. So for you guys, you should actually end up getting, I don't have an Apache cookbook with anything in it on the server, but you guys should actually get Apache installed. So did that work for you guys? Did you run Chef Client? Okay. So what you should see is something like this, which is really washed out. <laughs> uh, package HTTP will be installed. The service will be enabled, started as well and then the template should get created. And then you should be able to go, once you open the port, you should be able to go to that web, web page and actually get something back. So where are you guys at? Uh, it's, it's, it's installed. Okay. Not sure. Yeah, your template. Oh, um. Probably. No, what it's saying is is that uh, this directory doesn't exist. Um, this is Ubuntu, right? Yeah. What's the default location for the www root on? Oh, there's no HTML. Yeah. So that's fine. So everybody should get an error, which is good, because you can see what the error is. Huh? Yeah, but you didn't install, so show me your recipe. Because you don't have anything else in your recipe, it looks like. Did you save it? So this isn't saved. Cancel. All right. Free software. I need to buy it. So it's still not saved for you, right? So that dot? Oh, that's a note. I'm looking at the wrong one. Okay, now do an upload again. Yeah. And then go back to your node and run chess line. So, you get an error. 
So everyone got an error, which is great because you can see what the error output looks like. Um, the error output, what's cool about the error output is you'll notice how you wrote the recipe. Um, so you'll see this right here. So this is what you're failing on. And it shows you what, how you wrote it. Then it also shows you how Chef evaluated it, right? And so you'll actually get all of the defaults that Chef put in there for you as part of that resource block. So did that error fix it? Yeah, I just had to remove the yeah. HTML. So on Ubuntu, it's var www. Dub, there's no HTML. So fix that line, save it, re-upload it, and it should work smashingly. And then go to the your or the IP address of your server, and you should be able to get Hello World back. Did you? Yeah. You have to open it up was 48. Actually, it was actually already there, so I changed the text because that it just so happens mm -hmm. that Hello World exclamation point is Apache's default index. So. Sure. <laughs> We're going to change the text here in a second. Working ahead. So let's take like a five minute break and then come back and we'll pick up and then this will give it a chance of anyone who's behind.